Cardiac tamponade is a life-threatening condition characterized by the accumulation of pericardial fluid in the pericardial space. The pericardium is uh, layers which envelop the heart. When fluid increases in the pericardium rapidly, it compresses all heart chambers in that it will impair venous return to the heart. Essentially, filling of the heart is decreased, resulting in a reduced cardiac output, and in later stages, obstructive shock. Let us learn about the anatomy and function of the normal pericardium. Here is a normal chest x-ray, and here sits the heart. The heart is enveloped by the pericardium. The pericardium is made up of two main layers, a thin internal layer known as the serous pericardium, which forms the visceral and parietal uh, pericardium. And the second is the outer tough external layer known as the fibrous pericardium. The pericardium contains a small amount of serous fluid, which allows frictionless cardiac movement. The pericardial sac can also adapt to changes in the heart size, as it fills, for example. The pericardium functions to provide a protective environment for cardiac functions, essentially also like a barrier. The fluid in the pericardium can accumulate, and there are many causes. When this happens, it is called a pericardial effusion. A pericardial fusion may progress to a cardiac tamponade, which is where a pericardial effusion is symptomatic. The causes of pericardial fusion include accumulation of blood in the pericardial sac following a ruptured myocardium after a myocardial infarction. Any organisms, be it bacteria or viruses, can also cause inflammation of the pericardium. This is termed pericarditis, and will cause accumulation of fluid within the pericardial space. Other vascular causes of pericardial effusion include aortic dissection and aortic root rupture. Malignant cells can infiltrate the pericardium, causing a malignant pericardial effusion. Radiotherapy, as in radiation, can also damage the pericardium, causing a pericardial effusion. Interestingly, autoimmune diseases, including systemic lupus erythematosus and sarcoidosis, is also um, associated with uh, effusions in the pericardium. Very important, uh, trauma, where, whether it be a blunt or penetrating injury, can lead to obvious effusions uh, accumulating in the pericardial sac from damage to the heart, or iatrogenic causes, such as following a cardiothoracic surgery, such as a coronary artery bypass uh, procedure. Certain medications can also uh, cause pericardial fusions. There's cyclosporins, hydralazine, and isoniazids, which have been associated with pericardial effusions. Pericardial effusion, as mentioned, can progress and become a cardiac tamponade. It is actually not only the amount of fluid you need in the pericardium to cause a tamponade, but also how fast the fluid accumulates. An acute pericardial effusion is life-threatening. A chronic slow accumulation of pericardial fluid is benign, but may eventually manifest with symptoms as it grows. Here is a chest x-ray of the same person who has developed cardiac tamponade. Note the large heart size now. Going over the pathophysiology, when you have increase in fluid in the pericardial space, there is increase in pressure against all four chambers of the heart, including the two ventricles. This means the ventricles can't expand during diastole. They have a fixed ventricular volume, meaning the preload is reduced, which is the amount of blood returning to the heart. As a result, cardiac tamponade causes impairment of right ventricular filling, causing signs of right-sided uh, right heart failure because everything gets pushed back, essentially. Signs of right-sided heart failure include elevated jugular venous pressures, pedal edema, and ascites. 
Cardiac tamponade also results in impairment of left ventricular filling, causing left-sided heart failure, which is essentially a decrease in cardiac output. A decrease in cardiac output causes low blood pressure as well as dyspnea. A significant decrease in cardiac output causes shock, in this case, obstructive or cardiogenic. And of course, if you auscultate this area, because of all that fluid around the heart, the heart sounds are muffled. An important thing to understand relating to cardiac physiology here is cardiac output is equal to heart rate by stroke volume. Preload is a determinant of stroke volume, and so is afterload and contractility. A reduced preload, as seen in cardiac tamponade, will cause a reduced uh, stroke volume and thus a decrease in cardiac output, based on this simple equation. The most important clinical manifestation of cardiac tamponade is a triad of distended jugular venous pressure, low blood pressure, and muffled heart sounds. This triad is called Beck's triad, first described by Claude Beck in, nine, in the 1930s, and it was specifically used to describe acute cardiac tamponade. Claude Beck actually described a second triad for chronic tamponade, which involves ascites. Other clinical features of cardiac tamponade include tachycardia, tachypnea, pericardial rub if pericarditis is involved, pulsus paradoxus, and Kuzmal sign, which is usually seen in a something called constrictive pericarditis rather than cardiac tamponade. Kuzmal sign is actually very interesting and an important clinical examination finding. Kuzmal sign is present when, during inspiration, the person's neck veins bulge and distend rather than collapse. Kuzmal sign is a typical feature of constrictive pericarditis, but can also be seen in cardiac tamponade. Normally, during inspiration, there is an increased filling in the right side of the heart due to a decrease in intrathoracic pressure. This increased filling to the right side of the heart normally collapses the neck veins. In constrictive pericarditis, there is restricted filling, and so you get the distended neck veins instead. Another very important clinical finding in cardiac tamponade is pulsus paradoxus, which is defined as an abnormal inspiratory decrease in systolic blood pressure of greater than 10 millimeters mercury. Normally, during inspiration, there is an increased filling to the right side of the heart. And again, this is because intrathoracic pressure decreases with inspiration, allowing more fluid to move inside. The increased volume to the right ventricle during inspiration will cause interventricular septum to bulge to the left. The bulge of the septum to the left ventricle results in a slightly decreased left ventricular filling volume and therefore slightly decreased systolic blood pressure. But this doesn't really have much of an impact normally because the, there is the ability of the left ventricle to expand in, in the pericardium to compensate for the septal shift. During expiration, the opposite occurs. There is bulging to the right side. The arterial blood pressure trace is an accurate measurement of a person's blood pressure. It shows you the pressure in the arteries during systole and diastole. In a normal person, during inspiration, there is a subtle change in systolic blood pressure, usually no more than 5 millimeters mercury. You can experiment with this uh, physiological mechanism by feeling your own pulse. If you feel your pulse right now and take a deep breath in, you might notice it to become softer when compared to expiration. In cardiac tamponade, there is restriction in ventricular filling, with 
inspiration, there is significant interventricular septal bulge to the left, decreasing left ventricular filling volume, causing a reduction in cardiac output and systolic blood pressure. During expiration, the interventricular septum bulges to the right, increasing cardiac output. If you look at a arterial blood pressure trace of someone with cardiac tamponade, what you might see is a wandering baseline. During inspiration, there is a big difference in systolic blood pressure. Pulsus paradoxus is when this change is more than 10 millimeters mercury. Investigations that can uh, be ordered for someone with a cardiac effusion or tamponade include a chest x-ray, which we have seen. The heart is obviously grossly enlarged and tamponade. ECG will show something called electrical alterons, which is alternating uh, waveforms. The QRS is big and small, and this is due to the pericardial fluid encasing the heart and the electrical activity that is received by the ECG during this uh, measurement. An echocardiogram. And this is useful in assessing and quantifying the amount of pericardial effusion and the impact it has on other organs, including backflow. Other investigations include blood tests to help identify the potential causes of the pericardial effusion, including troponin to look for myocardial infarction and an autoimmune screen. Cardiac tamponade is a life-threatening condition. Management is emergency drainage via pericardiosynthesis, where a needle essentially is stuck in the pericardial uh, space and the fluid is drained out. After this treatment, the underlying cause of the effusion is then investigated and managed. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video.